Hey everyone, it's Rob Stanley with the Ecom Wiz podcast, and today I have a special guest, Seth Kniep, Kniepin It Real with just one dime. Thanks, Seth. Hey, that's awesome. I, I love I love your videos. Love everything you do on YouTube. And today I'd like to actually talk to you about well, a bunch of things. We're going to talk about a bunch, but specifically uh, some easy steps for Amazon FBA beginners to be successful in 2020. And I know you've been covering that a lot in your videos and your and uh, you know, your videos on YouTube. And I want to just jump right in and let's go straight into uh, how people can understand uh, the, the getting started process for selling on Amazon. Why don't you jump right in and tell people, uh, you actually had a, a, what was it, a several part series that kind of talked about four kind of steps to being successful. Right. Why don't you tell everybody uh, the start of those steps? Sure, absolutely. So thank you so much, Rob, for having me on. I will go straight to it. So guys, if you are selling on Amazon or you want to sell on Amazon, the first thing you need to do is decide what your product is going to be. And that product has to be differentiated. You need to be fixing a problem no one else is fixing. The best place to go is read the competitor's critical reviews. And there's really two ways you can differentiate. What we like to call it, Rob, in our office is betterentiate. It's kind of a new word. We're, we're trying to get that word to tread. Because <laughs> nice. I always ask this question. If someone says, why is my product selling? I'll say, why would I buy your products instead of the competition? And there's, there's two ways. One is you're fixing a problem that no one else is fixing, or two, you're improving it in a way that no one else is improving it. Well, how do I know it's a problem they want fixed, or how do I know it's an improvement they want improved? Well, I read what the customers are saying. Well, what are the customers? The people leaving the critical review. So the first step is you need to find a product. Yes, of course, it needs to have sales. It needs to have search volume. It needs to have demand. But how am I fixing that problem? And the beauty of it, is the better you do differentiating, the less funny money you will spend on advertising and launching the product because people are going to click it anyways because they see that your product stands out. Now, here's one mistake a lot of people make. They will read the critical reviews. Let's just say there's 10 top competitors and spread across those competitors. One of them, one of those competitors, they have 70 different times the customers are saying, well, the problem is this product is too heavy. And so what a lot of sellers will think is, oh, well, since that's the most common complaint, I'm going to make a light version of it by using a superior material. The problem with that is that's much less effective than if of the top 10 competitors, each of them five times a critical review said the problem is the product is too heavy. Even though that's much fewer, that's only 50 occurrences of the problem, much fewer than 70, because the problem is spread out, it'll actually convert better. Because when people look at products, they don't just look at one and see, oh, a lot of complaints on this. They look at multiple, and it's the one they see coming up the most across the board of competitors. That's the most important problem to fix. Yeah, I think you also have to be aware of, uh, you know, taking that example you gave with maybe it's too heavy. Uh, they switch to a different material. You could run into other issues with that material, A, and B, uh, now your price point could maybe be higher that maybe people are at that point, they're like, hey, for that extra price difference, I'll just go with it being heavier. So you kind of have to be careful of that also. Very, now, what very about, good. yeah, and what about uh, like finding trustworthy suppliers? Now, I personally have been in situations, I think I, I saw that you had lost quite a bit of money and I Only personally- 20,000. <laughs> I, I got you beat. $20,000, man. I lost- stupid mistake. <laughs> 50,000 I lost one time from oh, a supplier. And actually, it ended up being a shipping issue and not necessarily a supplier just running off with the money. But Rob, uh, this is why I like you because you've made mistakes and you still keep going. Those are the kind of people I trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think everybody has to make mistakes. And part of the reason we put out this information is to help you avoid some of these mistakes. They will happen. Hopefully, they're at lesser levels than 50,000 and 20,000. But, uh, you know, give, give people a little bit of an idea of what they should look for when they're looking for like a trust a supplier they can trust. Absolutely. The easiest place to go is to start with Alibaba. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of it. But a lot of people ask, well, how do I know there's someone I can trust? There's several things you can do. First, you can filter them down. After you search your main keyword, you can filter them down to an assessed supplier. If they've been assessed and someone did a factory inspection of that company, that means a third party company had to go in and look at it to make sure it's a legitimate business that will decrease the chance that it's a supplier you can't trust. Years ago, Alibaba had a lot more scams on it than it does today. Alibaba 
fired a ton of their staff. There were a lot of these schemes and scams going on and they just revamped everything on the back end to really raise the bar. And that's why Alibaba has continued to grow in their trust index versus way back in like the mid 2000s. So it really has improved. So that's the first thing you can do. Um, second, ask for a sample. Do not negotiate on a sample. It looks amateur. Like ask for a sample, but don't negotiate. If you do, they're figure in their mind, you're a newbie seller. No one negotiates yeah. on samples because you're not in this to save 50 bucks. You're in this to make a hundred thousand bucks. And so what you negotiate is the large quantities. When you ask for the sample, if they can't send it to you within a week and a half, then they're probably a trading company. Many of them, if you go to the about section on Alibaba, it'll show you, it'll say that it's either a trading company or a manufacturer or both but you don't ever know if that's entirely true. So for example, there could be a, a supplier out there that's making these coffee mugs and they, they specialize in what is called new bone China, the material of these coffee mugs. Mm -hmm. But you might come along and say, well, yeah, I need those coffee mugs, but I'd also like a coaster to go underneath it. And I said, no problem, we got it covered. I guarantee they do not make the coaster. They're sourcing it from someone else. Their factory's not set up to make products out of cork. When when their factory is set up to make products out of new bone China. And there's nothing wrong with the trading company. Just understand it's not as clean as it's a trading company or it's a supplier. A lot of suppliers will, will be the supplier. Yes, they'll upcharge you so they make money, but they will manage the process of finding someone else so you don't have to. You pay a little more for it. They're not going to tell you this. And they become your one-stop shop supplier. That's completely legit. But when it comes to the main product, Rob, I want to know that it is the manufacturer. I want to know that they specialize in New Bone China. Therefore, if they can't send me that sample within a week and a half, they're probably getting it from another company. And that sample is not, it's not the model that I want them to build. It's just a sample of their workmanship. You know, if they're a real supplier, they should have products sitting all over the place, like extra products. They couldn't get it in the box. When they put, packed it up, they have an extra, you know, 50 products over here and they haven't sold it yet. So that shouldn't be an issue. The goal is to test the speed of shipping, like how, how quickly do they have it ready? And then second, the goal is to test the workmanship. Yep. Third, if you are able to, well, actually, let me go back before I go there. Third, get them on WeChat. Their favorite application is WeChat, and you get them on video and just directly ask them, do you sell on Amazon? If they talk to you uh, over video chat, the chances of them lying about that is much less. Now, in Chinese culture, it's more normal to lie in business and say yes to everything, even if it's no to half the questions. Whereas in other like Western countries, we see that as immoral, they don't. Yeah. And it's just a reality people need to be aware of. But if you get them on video chat, the chances of them lying are much less. You just ask them directly and tell them, either way, I'm gonna find out. Either way, we're gonna do a factory inspection and a product inspection. I just wanna know ahead of time. If they sell on Amazon, does that mean it's a deal breaker? Not necessarily, it depends. In most cases for me, it is a deal breaker. The, the fourth thing is once you begin negotiating with them, negotiate on the big quantities, not the small quantities. So earlier I said, don't negotiate on the sample. You also don't want to negotiate on your first batch if it's only, let's say 250. In yeah. fact, the way I look at it, Rob, I'm not just investing in my product. I'm investing in the listing that holds my product. So if I lose money on my first batch, let's say I get it down to 200 MOQ, minimum order quantity, and, or I just, let's just say I break even, and it's just enough to get the product selling and to get ranking, I just invested in my listing. And as soon as I'm about to run out of inventory, if I can't get the next shipment in, I close that listing to freeze my BSR, I get the next order, I send it in, that's where I make money for two reasons. Number one, it's a bigger batch, so my cost per unit should be lower. And if they don't lower the price on you when you're ordering a bigger batch, that's a strong indication. Again, they may not be the manufacturer because trading companies tend to have set prices no matter what. An actual manufacturer makes more money the more you order. So it's easy for them to bring the price down. And I hear some people say, man, they only brought it down to $1.20. And my response is, wow, do you realize you just saved yourself like well over $20,200? Yeah. If you sell 20,000 of these, like that's huge savings. If you're thinking big, yeah. one more thought on this, um, Rob, I also noticed there's a lot of stuff going around the internet saying you need to start with 2000 units or 2,500 or 3,500 because I think I got to get profit. I got to get profit. And yeah. I agree you do, but I think it puts you at huge risk. There's no reason you can't say, look, my first batch, I'm willing to pay more. I only want 150, I only want 200. 
because that feedback you get from the customer is going to make you so much more money in the long run when you order the bigger batch. And then it gives you leverage. If you start with 2,500, you can only negotiate on a bigger amount. If you start with 200, you can negotiate on the 2,500 amount and that also gives you leverage. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in a couple things there. Yeah, you gotta yeah, watch go out. <laughs> you gotta watch out. Uh, one of the things we used to do just to kind of make sure we were dealing with factories, ask them for the catalog. If the catalog is all similar items, like, uh, I don't know, use like LED lighting, right? Everything in there is something to do with LED lighting and plastic LED lighting. You, you know it's probably a factory you're dealing with and that they're all, they, they, you know, you could see that that factory can make those variation type items. That's one thing you can do that would help a lot. The other thing we used to do is uh, when we'd go in, uh, after we got the sample, we verified everything was good on it. We would actually usually order anywhere three to five samples only because that way we could break one and you know do, right. do a bunch of things with it. Uh, the other thing is we would negotiate up front before we'd even place that say 200 order all the way up to like 10,000 or what is their max capacity? That, mm -hmm. And we would get that right up front. So we knew that, okay, if this is a big seller and we got to go back and order 10,000 now, we already knew the price. We right. didn't even have to negotiate it because we'd already pre-negotiated it ahead of time. And yeah. that, that actually helps quite a bit too because then you already know where you stand if you need to go back and only get 200 more or 1,000, you know, and if there's something in between. So yeah. that's something to think about also, but that's, that's, that's really great helpful. information. Yeah. And it, so just to back up slightly, when you were researching products, uh, you were talking a bit about using like the bestseller list, right, uh, to do that. And you were talking, I remember you mentioning, not on this podcast, but on one of your videos about your BSR. Talk yeah. a little bit about that a little more. Sure. So BSR stands for best sellers ranking. And what it means is, and I, I love this illustration. Imagine you're in a race with 100 people and you are number three. Okay. Now imagine you're in a race with 10 people and you, are, you come in third place. When you're in a race with 100 people, to get third place is a much bigger achievement than if only 10 people. So BSR is completely dependent on and relative to the number of product listings within that main category. So for example, if it's kitchen products, the lower your number, the higher your, the faster you're selling per day, which is great, that, that's awesome. But some people, they, they look at that and they say, well, I need an exact BSR across the board. Well, it doesn't work like that because if I go into, let's say handmade goods, which is a much lower quantity of offerings, then getting a, let's say 1000 BSR is not nearly as impressive as if I get a 1000 BSR in kitchen. Now there's something on this, Rob, I want to share because I find it so interesting and some of our students and coaches have applied it super effectively. We have been talking a lot lately about low profile products. Oh. What I mean by that is products that there's only three competitors for and the sales are strong, but the actual price of the product is high. In yeah. other words, the sale price range might be from 200 to 250. And I know that scares the freak out of some people at the beginning is to think, wait a minute, Rob said, there's no freak of way on earth. I'm going to source the product. Like, I can imagine what the per unit cost of that is. But hold on, there's, there's two reasons it often will um, cost you much less money and make you far more in far less headache. Number one, the MOQ on higher cost products is always lower. Just as a general rule, if you're buying let's say refrigerators, then your MOQ might be, and this is somewhat random because I have not sourced refrigerators, Rob, but 20 instead of 200 of some other product, okay? The nice thing about it is because the majority of sellers are intimidated by those numbers, they won't even enter that category, just a few specialists. Therefore, when you run PPC, your cost per click for your keywords is far lower. It's like if I am, let's say, sorry, I always have to use a coffee mug. I've done it for four <laughs> years and it won't stop. <laughs> so let's just like, someone one day they're like, I'm a video, they go, Seth, can you use a different item instead of a coffee mug? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so last time I used a sham bong, which is like this weird, like, uh, oh, what is it? It's like for alcohol and it's got this tube. It looks like for smoking a vape or weed or something. <laughs> 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 I don't smoke weed. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. If I am selling this coffee mug, and let's say there are 25 high competitors. And in, based on the standards I like to use, Rob, if they're selling about 15 times a day or more, that I would consider a strong seller, a, a competitor. Sure. If there's, if, let's, say there's, let's say there's 50, 50 competitors. That means there's a lot of competitors bidding on the keyword Sweden coffee mug. 
Yeah. Therefore, or just like if I'm at a bidding auction, the more people there, the higher the price gets because there's someone there with deep pockets who's gonna keep bidding, 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 bidding until it's really expensive. But if this is a refrigerator and there's only three top competitors, there's not a lot of bidders. The cost of the PPC goes down drastically. Additionally, and, and Rob, this is my favorite part, <laughs> you have fixed costs. So for example, let's just take two examples, okay? Let's say I have a coffee mug here and I'm gonna sell it for 15 bucks, which is a terrible price to sell product for. I don't think anyone should sell a product for less than $25 anyways. Yeah. Now let's say I have another item here. It's not a coffee mug, but it's about the same size and weight and it sells for 50 bucks. The cost for shipping these is pretty much the same. The only thing that can vary is a product category and that can affect the kind of tariff you have to pay based on the kind of product from your HTIC code. The FBA fees are the same. Yep. Because again, they're based on size and weight. The only two things that are different is the referral fee because it's a percentage of the sale and then obviously the manufacturing cost. So in other words, I have fixed costs that don't go higher when the price of the product type goes higher. Therefore, as a general rule, the higher price items you sell, the fatter your margins will be, the fewer keyword competition you have, the easier your PPC strategy, the more money you're going to make. Absolutely. On the Amazon business I had, and I mentioned this on a podcast before, some of the products that did the best were actually oversized products. Yeah. Uh, things that people wouldn't go after because they, they run away from them. <laughs> yeah. They didn't fit in the little box they wanted it in. Right. right. Well, the, it doesn't go ever to us. It goes straight to Amazon. So what do I care? In fact, it actually helped out because we could fit a lot more stuff in like a 40 foot container and, mm -hmm. you know, put several different products in there. You got to, you get your best discount when you go to a, like a, I think it's like a 40 footer and you fill it completely with your own items and go right. straight to FBA. I mean, yeah. so, and then I remember one time we did really well. This was quite a few years ago before it really took off was patio furniture. Now mm -hmm. we all know patio furniture takes up a lot of space and you get very few of them into a container. Right. And man, we did great on it until, you know, you got like Costco came in and a bunch of others and started carrying patio furniture cheaper because, you know, right. they're, they're doing, you know, thousands of containers versus the yeah. few we were doing. But yeah, remember you're right. Back, remember back, Rob, when it was really popular to say it fits in a shoebox? Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to teach the same thing years ago and I applied it. So yeah. we should do like a video called Where's My Shoebox or something. Yeah. Or, <laughs> like or a, the... The video cassette box too. That was a big one uh, back in the day too. Yeah. 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 That was, that was crazy how everybody had the VHS tapes went into a box and they would ship them. So man, those were, I made so much money on those boxes from selling my iPhone stuff, but anyways, whole different story. All right. So yeah, that's great. That's great information. Uh, let's, let's jump into, I got a few more questions for you. So how about, yeah. is this a good time for someone to start selling on Amazon and why? Okay, so I'm going to answer this question probably in a non-kosher way. Okay. For someone not to start now, they either have to be lacking a lot of knowledge or absolutely crazy if they're trying to make money. Like that's how important this is. And, and, and I say that with, with open transparency. There has never been a better time. The greatest companies often are built in times of crisis, not so, times where everything's going hunky-dory great and everything's peaceful. No, this is the time. Airbnb, Pinterest, Uber. I could go on all day talking about companies. WhatsApp that started with the last financial crisis. What's unique, though, about this crisis that wasn't true of 2008 to 2010, which I love, Rob, is this crisis is specifically driving people to sell online and to buy online. That's the crazy part. If, I could, if someone gave me a dime for every time they said, I'm going to wait till things are normal, I would be twice the millionaire I am. <laughs> because they say that and I say, why are you looking for normality? Opportunity is always in the moment at the heart of stress, conflict, fear, worry, destruction. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. Like when do people grow the most? When things are tough. When I look at my marriage, the times that we grew the most was when things were really hard. That helped us to establish a foundation. Well, the same is true of business. If you're trying to make money, my question is, why wouldn't you start right now? Like, what in the world do you have to lose? At the worst, you try, it doesn't work, and you grew a lot and you learned a lot. But chances are, if you do it right and you get the right knowledge and the right people like Rob working with you and helping, oh my goodness, you can blow this up. Absolutely 1,000%. 
We just took a screenshot yesterday of one of the stores we're building, almost 500,000 in the last 30 days. Wow. I'll send it to days. you later if you want to use it on this, like almost 500 freaking thousand in the last 30 days, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. We started a over. brand new store last wow. July. We scaled it, it um, last March to over a hundred thousand a month. We started it in July. Wow. I don't say this to brag. I say I'm a normal person. I, I don't have special gifts. I don't have special abilities other than I'm a little crazy. My wife tells me that. We just take the knowledge we're learning and we apply and we apply and I learn from others and they learn from me and we have a team of people and we just keep hustling and there's no reason other people can't do this too. Yeah. So to and answer I, your question, yes, right now. Yeah. And I think that's why I connect with you so much. A, Seth is definitely a hustler. He's a person that puts himself out there. I, you know, go look at the videos. He puts himself out there. He tries things, right? He's always trying things. Approachable person. You're definitely an approachable person. Every time I've talked to you, it's always down to earth, very like, hey, you know, we just saw each other a couple days ago. Let's keep talking, you know, and, and he loves to talk business. And he's not, you know, you hear about some of these people that their families had a lot of money and they became successful. I've, I always connect best with the ones that started basically with nothing and worked it up to a, a business. And, and those are always the success stories I love to have on the show. I love to talk to uh, well, like you mentioned, when things are bad, it seems to bring out the best in the entrepreneurs that really want to go out there and be successful. 2009, 10, and 11 were the biggest years of my iPhone business. And that was also what? The biggest, wow. re, what? The, the recession. Well, yeah. It was the biggest recession until maybe now, but it was one of the big ones, <laughs> right? right? That one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, could, I look back at it and I kind of was figuring out why was it successful? A, right. it had a lot to do with some changes we made. And B, it also had to do with the fact that I just happened to be at the right place at the right time when a lot of people didn't have money and they were, instead of upgrading to new phones, they were fixing their phones hmm. and it, cause it was very expensive. Now, yeah. please don't jump into arena. It is really <laughs> hard and not easy to do. Uh, and I don't suggest it for anybody, but, you know what uh, I love about what you said, Rob, you said, you just said, you said, please don't jump in that arena. And you're so right. When I first started, I was driving for Uber and Lyft, just trying to get enough cash to pay off my debts. I was watching Dave Ramsey. I was trying to do the whole, get rid of the debt, get rid of the credit card thing. And I remember every time I heard an opportunity that they would talk about online, I would think, oh, then I should do it too. And, and I think that's what happens is people, we naturally want the masses to validate us, to make us feel more secure. So if he, we hear that something is working, it becomes a, a me too strategy, which results in a me too product, which results in a me too business, which results in making no money. It's actually the differentiation, not just of the product, but the strategy. You differentiated yeah. yourself. You did something unique at the right time and it made a lot of wealth for you that's what's so amazing is every person has unique experiences they can apply to find those hidden gem of opportunities but as soon as it's popular and everyone's doing it that's a sign i shouldn't be doing it there's a different strategy i can use and that's why i think for an entrepreneur to succeed they have to be willing to trust their instincts and also look at data they need intuition and observation on the personality scale you combine those or get a partner who bounces you out and that's how you can succeed really effectively. Absolutely. You got to pivot. You got to pivot yes. because 2013 yes. is when I jumped into my other business partners, Amazon business. Well, we called it import business back then and started doing Amazon, right? He was already doing it completely different product line. And that's what I wanted. I wanted something that was not anything to do with the iPhone business. I wanted to go to a completely different direction. Uh, at that time, I, gosh, we probably were barely selling on Amazon with the iPhone stuff, but the other company was a hundred percent on Amazon and man, I'm so glad I did that. Cause that paid off so well also in the long run as we got more people that jumped into the iPhone business and flooded the market. So another question I have for you is kind of speaking of, you know, different people, who do you, who does Seth kind of look up to or kind of admire in the entrepreneur world? So to, so to speak. Yeah. So there's a few people. Um, the first one I say is going to sound a bit cliche because a lot of people say it, but it's still true. I have a lot of respect for Gary V okay. because he says it like it is. And I respect that. And he focuses on content and value. And I mean, even if you guys look at how he grew his social media platform, he did it by differentiating his strategy. He stopped trying to focus on likes and shares and he focused on what actually people want 
And how can I take hustle and compassion and mix them? I never seen someone be able to say, you know, cuss someone out so well and give them a hug and a kiss at the same time. He does it very, very effectively. Tough love and soft love. He mixes them really well. He's like the honey and the, what's the alternative? Um, the lemon, I forget. I'm looking at my wife to help me. She's like, are, are you, are you going, trying to go sweet and <laughs> sour here? <laughs> exactly, something like that. That just really <laughs> fell apart. But so That's I right. really, really respect what he does because it's almost like getting a shot of protein every day listening to him. So he's one guy. I've just recently started listening to Jocko and he interviewed this guy who was, who served in the military. He was Navy SEALs and one of his eyes was taken out. His, his name is slipping my mind. It'll hit me in a second or just like, if you want to check it out for me, look it up. Anyways, it's over two hours. It's an amazing, amazing interview. And he talks about this sense of entitlement and I think entitlement is one of the most dangerous things anyone can have because what it does is it creates a mentality that someone or something owes me something. And as long as I yeah. think that, I could say that about Apple, I was mistreated by my manager. I could say it about the guy who beat me up in front of my kids. I was sucker punched, attacked and beat up to unconscious bleeding. I could send you a picture, it's wow. disgusting. In front of my two kids, I could say, hey, that person owes me something. Now, even though what happened was wrong, Okay, I've been screwed over by suppliers. Th that is wrong, even though it's wrong. If I hold on to that wrong and let it become my new identity, I will destroy my business and I will live the rest of my life as a victim. I'm not saying don't show compassion to people who've been victimized. Absolutely, we have to show that, absolutely. But I am still responsible for my SHIT. At the end of the day, I'm the only person that gets in the way. In this, this particular episode, Josiah, could you look it up for me real quick? Mm -hmm. It's the Jocko one. Um, it's so good, it had me in tears. Like it was wow. so, it's episode number 22. It is, two, sorry, 222. It's with Dan Crenshaw. And okay. I'm telling you, anyone who wants to just like really take ownership for your life, I have nothing to complain about after this guy is a five-year-old, watched his mom die of wow. cancer, after this guy had half his vision blown away, after what he's gone through and his attitude, he used all the harm done against him and he turned it into motivation for others. And, 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 and Rob, at my heart, that's what I want to do. I believe we as humans can change the world. And I believe entrepreneurs can change the world because we have the money and the brokenness to do it. And by brokenness, I mean we've been so squished and so pulverized and so just like chewed up and spit out by life, but it gives us a passion and a power that is not comparable to anything. So to answer your question, Gary V, Jocko, and then Ted Beasley. Most people don't know him. He has mentored myself and Josiah on many occasions. He's here in Austin, he is a coach, and he helped us really understand how to run a business at a level no one has. Like the questions he would ask, just incredible. Ted. Beasley, amazing, amazing man. So those are just three of the people I look up to. But there is one more I have to mention, Rob. Go ahead. It's Josiah. So Josiah just so happens to be my son. Okay. He's my business partner. And he and I get in disagreements every day and we love it because he is the complete opposite of me. I'm the risk taker. He's defense. I'm offense. He's back end. I'm front end. I'm motivator. He's, is this actually going to work? Show me the data. And when you put those two together, he has been like a phenomenal influence in my life and helping me to not make unwise decisions. So a huge, huge credit goes to him. People don't usually see him. He doesn't like being on camera. I do, yeah. but I wouldn't be able to do what I do today if it wasn't for Josiah, who is my business partner and also my son. Yeah. Balance, right? That's the way I see it. I mean, my wife's been my business partner, well, gosh, ever since we met practically. But I mean, as far as like a physical business, we started ours in 2001. And even though we sold them, I mean, I still, even working at Feedback Quiz, I bounce things off of her, you know? And it's like, then again, like, like a week ago, we just celebrated 25 years of marriage and this November will be 30 years we've been together. Congratulations, and, well, that's awesome. Yeah, and she's that's not just my wife. Today. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, she's not just my wife and my friend and my, you know, everything. She, she also is that person I go to, you know? And, and she's that balance because, I'm like you, I could get, I could just go one direction and I go hard that one direction right. and she'll reel me right back in with, you know, 
hey, think about this or think about that. And she's man, like, you're heading towards a cliff. Do you see it? Like, <laughs> I see this opportunity. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I, you know, I hope I do that for her sometimes too. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's awesome. Well, gosh, thanks for, you know, giving us kind of an insight. This show's not over. We got more to go, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a great insight in you. And I, and I love hearing that because I listened to some of the podcasts that you've done and you definitely, there's some things you haven't really shared. So I wanted to come up with some good stuff that people don't necessarily get to hear about Seth all the time. So, okay. thank you. so what we do want to get into some of the stuff that, you know, that people maybe aren't aware of. Let's start with kind of prior to coming up with this just one dime idea, what were you doing and what led you there? And then I, I want a very specific question. Why yeah. the dime? <laughs> why the dime? When you get to that point, tell us why was it a dime and not a quarter or nickel or penny? You got it. I worked for the richest company in the world at that time. Apple was the richest and Apple actually is a great company, but my manager made my life hell. We never name the person. I don't do that, but really, truly a terrible manager. And I reached a, so I, the frustration was growing. Partly I just felt like I was meant to do something different. Partly I was tired of the the political games and the butt kissing people would play and the flattery to move up at Apple. And it just, I hated it. And I never sat well with that, but the, I really reached a breaking point when my manager shamed me in front of my subordinate for something like I did everything exactly as I was supposed to completely above board. But in order to protect herself from taking the blame, I was made to scapegoat in front of my subordinate. Like it was a really yeah. horrible situation. Like you're following all the steps and then they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Seth did this. And I'm sitting there thinking, got to be kidding me. So I was so uh, devastated in that moment, like just crushed. And it was over video chat. I worked from home. I took one of the, the windows and I put it over my manager's face just so I couldn't even look at her because I felt this false shame. So happens my wife is in the same room in my home office. And, I, and after that video chat, she's standing right there. And I'll never forget, I said, I'm done. I'm building a new life for our family. Like this is it. I, I reached a breaking point. And what I love about this is negative emotion, is more powerful than positive emotion. Mm -hmm. People usually don't make change until the pain is great enough. Something breaks, something switches over, something shifts in their mind. They're like, this is no longer worth it. I don't care if I'm naked on the street. I would prefer that fighting for freedom than this and all the security and comfort that comes from working for the richest company in the world. So one day I'm driving in our broke up, broken down minivan. I'm like really broken down, like had dents and everything. And, and I was just used to it. And I look down in a coin tray and I just, it, I don't know how Rob, but the thought came across my mind that the dime is the smallest U S coin for its size. True. I, I mean, for its value, sorry, for its yeah, value. Yeah. And, and for some reason the, the number a hundred thousand came to my mind, like, Oh man, if I had a hundred thousand dollars, there's so much I could do with that. I could pay off part of my house. I could do, like this, the hundred thousand felt like a really good goal. And so then I started thinking, well, how many times if I just doubled this, would I have to double it to get to 100,000? And that's when I was shocked when I realized it was only 20 times. Wow. So that's when I began. I just started walking around, just walking around Austin, approaching random people and saying, will you double my dime for me? Well, why would I do that? Well, let me explain. There's a goal here. Someday I want to be able to give people hope and tell them, even if you start with something as small as a dime, you can completely change your life. Double it all the way up to $400 just for asking. Yeah, and go watch those videos, everybody. If you're whether you're listening or watching this right now, go watch the videos. I watched them; they're they're actually pretty entertaining. And I'm kind of curious. Just a quick question: I didn't even have this on our list of questions, but just quickly, how many times did you get like turned down that people about just want either about say it a, again? About a, about a third of the time. Third. About a third of the time. And yeah, what I would do is every day I would go out. My son EJ would go with me. He would hold up the iPod and he would record it. Cause I knew someday I want to document this. Like I uh, not, I didn't consistently believe this, but more often than not, I believed I could make a ton of money doing this and can change our family's life. I had to believe if I didn't believe it wouldn't have happened. And even though some days I would doubt myself and wonder and get discouraged and get rejected, but about a third of the time I had to just, I knew I just had to keep going. And every day I come home and right to my right was a little drawer and I would stick the money in an envelope and write down, I'd mark out the old number and put in the new. And at one point when we got to like, I forget what the number was, 16 or $17, I moved it to an even number to keep it simple. Otherwise it's like always something in sense and it's complicated. Yeah. And then it was like from 10 to 20 to 30, or sorry, 10 to 20 to 40 to 80 to 160, so forth. Yeah. And then got up to $400. And by the way, the guy, when I handed him 200 and he said, okay, here you go, I'm gonna give you, you keep your 200, I'll give you 200 more. 
He yeah. doubled us to 400. He was also an entrepreneur and he got it. Like he really got it and he loved what we were doing. And I later went back and talked to him after I became a multimillionaire and thanked him for taking a chance on me. $200 was a lot for meeting oh, yeah. a random stranger the first time, Rob. Like that was huge to me. Absolutely. It, it, I'm watching, so I'm watching your videos and here's my mindset. I'm watching the videos and there was a couple, I think a couple of videos you went to some businesses mm -hmm. and you kind of did, I want to say kind of like a little spotlight for them. Yep. And I'm sitting there going, man, Seth could have made a whole career of going to local businesses, putting like almost do like videos for them. Cause around the time you're doing it, it uh, YouTube was pretty big and yeah. it was integrated pretty heavily with Google searches. If yep. you just titled it right, there would have popped up this video of you interviewing. I think it was two guys in a garage that fix cars. Another one looked like uh, either some sort of food place. Yes. And I was like, man, Seth missed, kind of missed a whole nother opportunity there <laughs> in oh, my you head. To, you have to stop talking because if you keep going, I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's another opportunity. <laughs> See, but but <laughs> like that's my mindset. I'm like a kid at the buffet and my, my stomach is like time. Absolutely. But that's the mindset when I'm watching it. I'm already yeah. looking at what opportunities yeah. you could have also done. Now, okay, so let's go on with, uh, you know, kind of more about this uh, story because there is a lot more to it. Um, so as you kind of progressed and you got up to a certain amount, what transitioned you from that 400 to I want to start selling on Amazon? How did that come about? So it started with eBay first. For some reason, I felt more comfortable with eBay, probably because I sold a guitar in the early 2000s on eBay a long time ago, back when the website was really clunky and horribly <laughs> ugly, but it still worked. So it just felt more tangible somehow, like I had more control over it. So I just started reading everything I could about selling eBay. And I learned that you look at the top sellers, they're very similar to Amazon. You look at, you know, if there's a few top sellers and it's selling well, and you sort it by buy now instead of an offer, instead of a bid, because you're not looking for one offs. I want to buy multiple of the same thing and sell it over and over again, which saves me time, which leverages my resources and increases my ROI. So I just started researching like crazy. And I started in the fitness health category because I love fitness. I love health. I love running and working out and tap dancing. And, and then I remember Pat Flynn saying the riches are in the niches. <laughs> it's yep. like, okay, this is, That's I got to stop looking. True. This is probably where a ton of people are looking. So I decided to go to the categories on eBay and find the most unlikely category possible. And that was cemetery. I was like, who else, who in the world is going to go into cemetery category to sell products? And that's when I found cremation urns. That was my very wow. first product. I put them on eBay, I made the listing, terrible pictures, bought these little whiteboards from Walmart and took the pictures and they always looked blue and I couldn't understand why. Well, that's because of the sky. I didn't even know that the sky could do that <laughs> because it was on my front porch. But I, I was hustling, I was trying, I was learning, I was growing and sold hardly any. And then one day I randomly just said, you know, I'll try to put them on Amazon, see what happens. And then they, they took off. And this was yeah. FBM. When I switched over to FBA, we started selling up to 10 a day. And there were about $10 profit per product. I got them off of DHK. So that's $100, around $100 a day. And so I created a spreadsheet and I planned out, man, if each product did this well, how many products would I need to get to get to 100,000? And I would show it to my wife. And she never ever rejected what I did, but she just, she was supportive, but she didn't believe it. She needed to see it to believe it. Like, yeah, that's cool, Seth. Like, that's good for you. And so I really couldn't depend on her um, belief or her reinforcement to keep going. And I think this is where a lot of, a lot of men and women struggle is they feel like they can't do it unless their spouse is hundred percent there. I'm, my response is show them grace and time. Their path is different than yours. If this is what you need to do, you just do it. And eventually they're going to see it and they will jump ahead. And, and that's what happened with her. So we started selling Amazon and that's when it really started to blow up. That's when I started to learn about differentiation and how do you do this? How do you order manufacturers? And we just started building these product lines of products and it just started to expand. And we blew past a hundred thousand. It was either right before I forget. It was like right around the six month mark. Like it was fast. And I, I didn't even, you know what's funny about it, Rob? I, at that point, I was so focused on growing the business. It just kind of went through and was like, oh, like hardly noticed it. Yeah. Then when we reached a million, I, I was like, oh my goodness. We just, I couldn't believe it. And, and I remember when I was, um, I was in conversation, I'm not trying to name drop here, but it's, it's relevant. When I was in conversation with Kevin O'Leary, he said, he said something, I'll ne never forget it. He said, 
Kevin Lillard from Shark Tank. He said, yeah. when you're focused on your business and your profits and growing and you enjoy it, all of a sudden you, you do know your numbers, but the end goal is not really wealth. It's freedom and you love what you do. Yeah. And all of a sudden you just notice, man, we're making a lot of money. It's like almost the byproduct and no longer the main goal anymore. And, and I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs give up is if they don't enjoy the journey and it's just about the money, yeah, you're going to give up because you won't always make money every day. Some days you lose money, but you got to lose money to make money. Kind of like I have to work out in the gym and feel like I'm losing. I can't lift it. But guess yeah. what? That's going to make me stronger a day and a half later when I hit the gym again. You're absolutely right. Gosh, there's so much there too. And, and this is how you know Seth's been around a long time. DH Gate. Gosh, I remember buying and selling <laughs> stuff off of there. Isn't that that crazy? Was, and my I, my eBay accounts, I think I had one from 99 and one from 2001, and I still have the 2001. So definitely been around. Well, we got a few more questions before we wrap up here. So let yeah. me see if I can get through these. Uh, name some of the struggles that you had when you first started selling on Amazon. Just give us some highlights. Absolutely. Fear. Um, what if this doesn't sell? I just spent several thousand dollars. What if it doesn't sell? And sometimes it would happen. I had this horrible strategy, Rob. I would... First, we, were doing, we started doing a lot of arbitrage. We're buying and reselling on eBay, buying and reselling on Craigslist. We had people at a house. I'd meet them downtown Austin. Like, we were just like, me and my wife, as in we were hustling like crazy. Absolutely. But the hard part was, how do I know I should buy 1,200 of these instead of just, you know, buy five from Goodwill and resell it? Like, how do I know 1,200 is a good move? Because that's a lot of money to, to lose. And so what I did, terrible strategy, but I'm going to share it because it actually worked a little bit, is I would find like let's say 10 products that were, that were, when we bought them, they resold quickly on Amazon or eBay. And I would say, okay, if they're all selling well, well, let's now list as FBA and buy a bigger quantity. And if, let's say we sent in 10, but only three of them sold within a week. Then I would say, these are our new private label products. And the other seven I would ignore. The strategy itself is good in the sense that we're testing. It's just the way we went about it. We didn't use any software at that time. We didn't understand it. I was so new to selling online, Rob. Like, you want to talk about someone who didn't understand online? That's Seth Kinney, right? I was a tech support team at Apple. That is not the same thing. So, and I say that to encourage people listening. You don't have to be a geeky, techie, nerdy genius to make a lot of money online. You just don't. The tools are easier today than they ever were. So, fear was a big one. Another big struggle was transitioning out of Apple into my new position as an entrepreneur it was hard because yeah. I had to let go of the security. A part of, it's like a seed. A part of me had to die. I had to let the dream of Apple completely die. It hadn't yet completely die. I had to literally say that ship is sailing or it's better yet sunk to me. It is dead to me <laughs> yeah. so that I can now live a new life in that new life is selling on Amazon and building my own business. It's like my favorite illustration is, for something to resurrect, there has to be death first. There has to be death before life, just like a seed. And that's why I tattooed this tree on my arm. It is our logo. I put it here to remind me there was, once was a little seed. It had to die to bring up new life. So fear was one of them. Um, not getting a product inspection on my products because oh. I thought, oh, this is cool. I'll save over 200 bucks. Ended up costing me about $20,000 when you look at all the returns, the health of the account, the slowing of sales, reduced because our Seller Central account became unhealthy. Like all of that. You know how it goes. Bad so feedback, yep, yep. Shortcuts was a really dumb decision. If I had had someone to sit down and say, Seth, here's what to do, I would have saved $20,000. I'd probably be wealthier today as a result. I underestimated the value of knowledge um, big time. And I yeah. needed, it, it took me a lot of time to learn through my mistakes, to, to grow and get to where, okay, now we understand it well enough where our risk is always there, but it's much reduced. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can give you a lot more struggles, but no, I, I, I know you could. I know you could. We've, we've, uh, you've been in, been in this long enough that you've had plenty of them, but I appreciate that. Tell me, tell everybody, um, kind of two parter, how you go about finding coaches, uh, for the just one dime course. And what, what do you guys, what's in the just one dime course? Like what is it just a single course I go through multiple courses broken out, kind of explain to everybody what that is. And again, make sure you touch on how you find uh, these coaches that help you with this. Absolutely. So we like to call it a membership, even though it includes five courses, but we don't want people to feel they're just getting a course. And then we, you know, dust our hands and say, goodbye. We won't ever see you again. We actually spend a ton of time training them. So every week there's two to three hours of training from these coaches. These coaches are all Amazon sellers who make a lot of money and growing. So Every quarter, 
they have to send us screenshots of their profit and loss statements and the revenue. They can't just be generating, well, we're doing $200 a month. That's great. What are your profit margins? Well, the 33%. Great. What were they last quarter? Well, they were 29%. Great. You're growing. So the requirement is they have to be growing their store and their revenue in order to qualify. We have fired coaches who didn't qualify. And they understand it's not personal. It's just, here's the contract. You have to be successfully selling to be qualified because Amazon changes like the Midwest weather. It, like every day there's something new and you can't teach someone unless you're doing it. So, so that's the first part. The, um, the membership is five courses, but it also includes three one-to-one -one mentorship sessions. We also research, it used to be more, but we really raised the bar on this, just three potential product ideas for them. They still have to do the research, we teach them, but to give them a boost. Like here's an example of a great product and the research we did on keywords and everything and why we think it's a great idea, but you still need to research it because this is your business. Yeah. There's a ton more I could go on. We have a, a team in China, full-time staff who find suppliers through non-Alibaba gateways. Yep. So it decreases the chance that someone else would find the same supplier, yep. which gives them a little bit of exclusivity. Obviously a supplier could one day become, show up on Alibaba, we can't control that. But as much as humanly possible, well over 80% of the time, you won't find these suppliers on Alibaba because we're using a Chinese sourcing website like 1688 to find them and then cross-referencing that with Alibaba. So yeah. in a nutshell, Rob, here's the goal. We train people from people who are living and doing it every day, period. And we're nice. realistic. We don't act like it's easy. We say this, it's going to be hard, but you can completely change your life. Not just your wallet, but your heart. Like literally inside out, you become a more responsible, happy, growing, successful person because you built this wealth with your family. That's an amazing feeling versus getting a salary paycheck, which I will never go back to again. That's awesome. All right, before we wrap up, just a one last quick question. This will be a pretty easy one. If you could kind of just tell everybody approximately how many people have you trained that are now doing or have done over a million in gross revenue? Great question. We are currently today, we have over 12 people who are doing more than a million, not a year, a month. Oh, wow. There you go. That's that. Just leave it right there. Just, just leave, leave it right there. They're profitable. They are yeah. profitable. Our, our standard is 40% profit before PPC. If they're anywhere from 18 to like 33% after, I consider that extremely successful. That's so awesome. one of our coaches does 12 million a year right now. That's wow. That is great. All right, Seth, one last thing. Tell everybody how they can get a hold of you, your website, and tell them everything they need to know so they can come find out more. Absolutely. YouTube. Actually, Don't forget the YouTube. Absolutely. <laughs> and I will actually give them my personal email address. This okay. goes to me directly. Seth, S-E-T-H, at just one, O-N-E, spelled out dime, like the coin, dot com. So Seth, S-E-T-H, at just one dime, dot com. And then if they want to see all the other places like YouTube or Instagram, and we're, we have tons of content online that they can consume for free as well, just one dime, dot com, slash start. And they will get a 90 minute workshop that's 100% free and it's super into it takes everything we talked about and goes like 10 times deeper step by step by step just when i'm.com slash start if they're interested that's awesome seth thanks for being on the econ whiz podcast and i want you to sign us off with your saying this is seth can you can even a real go out, get out there and crush it you people let's go <laughs> right on thanks seth all right thanks so much rob Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and for more information, please visit feedbackwiz.com.